Thank you so much. Uh, it is such a delight to be here and to be with everybody. And I just want to start before I uh, begin my remarks by thanking the whole team at Catalyst Creative and Downtown Project. Uh, uh, Citizen University co-curated this week, uh, and we did so in a spirit of just joyful experimentation. And that's what it's been uh, all these last few days uh, of being here as we've been learning together uh, experience together, discovering together, and uh, um, I, in particular, uh, you know, Amanda's not here, but I'm, I'm going to say it for the record for the video. I want to give a shout out to Katie Vander Ark uh, from the Catalyst Creative team, who's just been so awesome. Where's Katie? Yeah, Katie has just been been the best, um, and really embodies, I think, the spirit of uh, both what they're trying to do here with Catalyst Week, but I think what's going on more broadly uh, in this very interesting experiment called. Uh, the Downtown Project in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, so as Rakesh said, um, my name is Eric Liu. I run this organization called Citizen University. And all of our work is about a very simple goal. And that is to rekindle the spirit and the practice of powerful citizenship here in the United States. And I think it's worth just before diving into that, backing up and giving a little bit of context of just literally how I got here. Um, I am the son of immigrants. I'm second generation American. My parents were born in China. Uh, they grew up in a war-torn China during the Sino-Japanese War and then the civil war between nationalists and communists in China. Uh, they ended up going to Taiwan when they were uh, early teenagers, actually younger than my daughter is today, uh, and then eventually came to the United States. Uh, and I was born in the United States. I was born in Poughkeepsie, uh, New York. And uh, uh, one of the things that I have always been imbued with from my parents. And I think, you know, there are plenty of people actually in this room who are themselves the children of immigrants, but uh, in a broader sense, we're all second generation. We all can relate to uh, either being immigrants or being connected to immigrants because uh, in this society, particularly in this city, there is just such a mobility. There's such a spirit of starting anew. There's such a spirit of just venturing forward and deciding, I'm going to create a new life in a new place, right? My parents had all of that, but they had something else as well. On my father's side, I inherited a certain spirit, uh, which came really from the name of his father. Uh, my paternal grandfather's name in Chinese is Liu Guoyun. Uh, Liu is the uh, family name, uh, my surname. And Guoyun translates roughly into deliverance of the nation. Right? So no pressure. Uh, <laughs> deliverance or destiny of the nation. And uh, he grew up uh, the son of a farmer, uh, as I say, uh, in China. Uh, and he grew up at a time that was incredibly, I suppose, auspicious, or at least you know, matching the, uh, the, the, the infamous Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Uh, he uh, grew up at a time when dynastic rule was ending and the emperors were falling and the new Republic of China was being born. And this grandfather of mine decided he wanted to be a pilot. Uh, and he became a pilot. He went to the first ever military academy in the first Republic of China. Uh, and he became a pilot for the first Air Force of the Republic of China. Uh, and he ended up, ended up fighting for China, first against the Japanese, then as a nationalist against the communists. And I never met this grandfather. Uh, I only ever knew him from a very severe photo of him in uniform uh, that was in my, fa in my family's study. Uh, but I knew that this idea of somebody named Guo Yun was not just an accident, and it wasn't just a name. Uh, that what was bequeathed to his sons and then to me in turn was this idea that if you are of this family, you need to be useful. You need to serve, you need to contribute, you need to participate, you need to be about something that's bigger than just yourself. If you're lucky, you may get a chance to deliver your nation. But even if you're not, you have an obligation to deliver upon every community that you are part of, right? And that was this thing, I never got a single lecture from my father or my mother about this. It was just in the ethos uh, of what our family was about. And my mother, uh, on, on her side of the family, uh, she has a fairly remarkable American story as well. She uh, came to this country um, about 20 years old, I think. Uh, very little money in her pockets. She landed at Baltimore Port uh, after taking a, riding basically in the cargo part of a, uh, a ship. Uh, and when she arrived in the United States, uh, one way to tell her story is that she, just by her own kind of wits and gumption and wherewithal, kind of figured stuff out and navigated her way up the coast and ended up in New York City, 
got herself work and began living the American dream. There's nothing about that version of the story that's untrue. But the more true version of the story is when she arrived on these shores, she was greeted by friends of the family, former students of her father who'd been a professor. They took her in. When they took her in, they helped get her plugged into different networks of both Chinese immigrants and others to help her look for jobs. When she landed a job, her, one of her first jobs, she was a file clerk in Manhattan for a, a coffee company called Chock Full of Nuts. <laughs> it still exists, actually. Uh, and uh, she was uh, a file clerk with you know, decent but limited English and very shy, this kind of young immigrant woman. Uh, and this kindly older executive, this African-American man, uh, just kind of started looking out for her. He told his secretary, look out for this Julia, Ju Julia II person. Uh, and you know, just make sure that she gets what she needs, make sure that she doesn't get lost in the cracks and the system doesn't uh, chew her up here. Uh, and this man's name was Mr. Robinson, and she, she didn't know him well, but every time she saw him in the elevator or in the hallway, he always had a nice word for her, and he always made her feel like, you are not here alone. You may be in the big city, you may be in this big country, pretty much by yourself, but you are not alone. We will look out for you. And she always had a soft spot for this guy, Mr. Robinson, and it wasn't until many years later uh, that she realized after reading something in the paper about him uh, that Mr. Robinson was a retired ball player whose first name was Jackie. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I get from that story uh, also maybe this sense of serendipity and kind of American possibility. But what I really get from that story is there is no such thing as a self-made man or woman. That everybody, no matter how much gumption and guts you've got, no matter how willing you are to take risks and dive into a new world and face all that, uh, that, that uh, comes, uh, that nobody makes it on their own. And these two ethoses that, number one, be useful, number two, there's no such thing as a self-made man or woman, uh, have formed not only my worldview but given me uh, the sense of direction about the work that I do. So this work about citizenship, and rekindling citizenship, I just want to unpack a little bit for you and tell you a little bit about not only what we do, but how we think about what we do. Because it turns out, through the, over these last couple of days, it is suffused into everything that is going on in all of the work that uh, uh, our participants are doing and all of the work that's unfolding in this community. Uh, just listening to John and to Kaz uh, today, uh, if you were here last night to listen to our speakers as well, the dots start connecting. They start jumping out at you to connect, right? Uh, and to me, citizenship really boils down to three very simple things, uh, things that it's important for us to name and to talk about. Power, character, and purpose. And I just want to say a word about each of these three things because we often move right past them. I mean, for one thing, in most places in, in this country, we don't even linger on the word citizenship. Right? To talk about citizenship or civics is like instant sleeping pill. It just starts making people doze off and lose interest and kind of switch the channel or turn off the TV, right? Uh, but this work of what it means to be an owner of, a participant in, a member of a greater body, a body that is greater than oneself, of whatever scale that body may be, is about these ideas of power, character, and purpose. So power, first of all, let's say a word about that. By power, I mean simply the capacity to have others do as you would have them do. Now, that may sound a little bit menacing, and it's that sense of menace that comes with the word power that often makes us very unwilling to even go there and talk about power. Power seems like a dirty word. All the phrases we have in our lexicon about power are things that are negative. Power trip, power mad, power hungry, right? We talk about power in ways that basically say we don't want it, or we don't want to be associated with it, or we don't want to at least show that we're associated with it. But the reality is that power is. Power is. Power is just like electricity. Power is just like fire. Power is just like physics. It is inherently neither good nor evil, right? And so the only question for us as citizens, as members of a self-governing community is, shall we decide to become literate in power? Or shall we keep our heads in the sand? Shall we decide to face and recognize what the meaning and the content of power is, what forms it takes, who has it, who doesn't have it, why that is, has it always been that way, how does it flow, where is it frozen, in what forms has it uh, unfolded in ways that are unimaginable today? 
When we unpack power that way, we're doing things that most of the time, most people in most places don't give themselves permission to do, which is in a sense to ask, what if? What if we had a slightly different arrangement of power? What if we had a slightly different array of people who had voice? What if we had a slightly different set of problems to solve or a different way of defining what even counted as a problem? That idea of power is so important for us to face and to reckon with. But simply becoming literate in power is just all about making a bunch of little Machiavellis, right? People who really understand how to manipulate and understand how to pull levers of power and understand how to move things. What we also have to do is to couple that sense of power with a spirit of character. When I talk about character, what I'm talking about is not just kind of individual virtue, you know, discipline and perseverance and honesty. Like, I'm all for those things. I'm all for personal virtue in that way. But I'm talking about character in the collective. I'm talking about what it means to be a non-sociopath, what it means to be a pro-social member of a family, of a city, of a community, of a country, right? And what it is at the level of values and ethics and how we teach one another those values and ethics and how we recognize that those values and ethics are incredibly contagious whether or not we speak of them. They are as contagious as be useful. They are as contagious as courtesy or discourtesy are contagious. They are as contagious as civility or incivility are contagious. As contagious as compassion or the lack thereof are contagious. When it comes to character in the collective, what we have to remember as citizens is society becomes how you behave. And that, if you actually sit with that, is sort of an un-American statement. Right? Because the prototypical American statement, in the West especially, in Las Vegas especially, is don't tread on me. Don't tell me what to do. I get to decide for myself, and I will do whatever the heck I want, as long as I'm not actively harming somebody else. And my selfishness is just my business. And someone else's goodness will cancel out my selfishness. <laughs> Society becomes how you behave says, that's not true. Your selfishness is as contagious as a virus. character in the collective. It doesn't just happen. We form it together. We form it with intention. We form it by our practices. That brings me to the third and final aspect of citizenship that we work on, and that is purpose. Now, the language of purpose is everywhere in the downtown project. It's everywhere in Zappos and Zappos land. It's everywhere in this idea that you build cultures with purpose that are not just about self or materialism or the here and now. But I think that we as citizens have to expand our notion of what purpose is, what common purpose is, and our ability to begin to tell a new story of us and what we're doing here. What are we doing here? What, uh, granted, now we're here because there's a thunderstorm going on and we're not going to walk outside. <laughs> but what brought us here, this small number of people who decided on a Friday night in Vegas to come to a double wide trailer and hear people talk, right? There are literally a thousand and one things that are more entertaining and more stimulating to do on a Friday night in Vegas. You are here because you are hungry for purpose. You are here because you want to be part of something bigger than yourself, part of a story that will precede you and extend beyond you. And our ability as citizens to both tell and to listen for that kind of story is again, not something we're born knowing how to do. It takes practice. At Citizen University, a lot of the work that we do, whether it's working with educators, working with new immigrants, working with veterans, working with people who are trying to reimagine civic education in our schools, all of what we're trying to do is to make people more literate in power, more grounded in civic character, and more conscious of purpose. And in many ways, and the thing that I want to close with is just a reflection back to those of you who are part of the downtown project, those of you who are residents of Las Vegas, and maybe even downtown Las Vegas, that the work you are doing here now is similarly about being mindful at every turn and in every choice and every act about power, character, and purpose. What's going on in downtown Las Vegas right now is, to me, an exceptional, exciting, nearly unprecedented, and very, you know, juries out experiment. How do you create a civic community, a civic garden in the desert, literally and figuratively? How do you do that? 
There are aspects here in, down, in the downtown project in downtown Las Vegas that's one part Plymouth Colony, one part Disneyland, you know, one part uh, Deadwood, South Dakota, kind of gold rush town, you know. You have all these different aspects and all the things that are connected, that connect a Plymouth Colony to a Deadwood to a Disneyland, is that these are American places with American stories. And the ethos of each of these American places, like them or not, say what you will about the oppressiveness of Plymouth Colony, or about the materialism of Disneyland, or about the brutalism of Deadwood in the gold rush and silver rush years, is that all these places recognize that you can talk all you want about rugged individualism. You can talk all you want about individualism and individual liberty. The reality is that rugged individualism never got a barn raised. Rugged individualism never made a neighborhood. Rugged individualism never turned a random loose collection of dots into a pattern. Random, rugged individualism never created a community that anybody wanted to say, I am a citizen of this community. And so what you here at the Downtown Project have the opportunity to do, and we who come through this co-curation as part of the larger family of Citizen University, what we've gotten to do by learning and experiencing here is we all get to push ourselves and each other a little bit more about how intentional we're going to be about our spirit and about our practice of powerful citizenship, whether it's here in Las Vegas or wherever it is that we've come from. And if we do that in how we listen to each other, how we truly see each other, how we feel one another, then I think this week will have lived up fully to its name because we will be catalysts, not only for citizenship, but for a greater good that will radiate out from Vegas through the rest of this country and beyond. Thank you very much.